I like to say like every single person that owns a property in that market is going to hear from me and they're going to hear from me regularly. So even if we capture a small percentage of that available group, it's profitable for us to do this. And then we do this in multiple markets, right? So we might only be at 500 to 700 in terms of our list size in a given, in a given area, but we're doing this across multiple different markets. Hey, I am so excited about this episode. It's a long time coming. Guys, we've got a great topic for you today. What's up? My name is Ellis Hammond, host of the Kingdom REI podcast show, founder of the Kingdom REI Mastermind. And listen, a lot of talk, small multifamily or big multifamily? Should we, or not even multifamily. Is it better to start with small deals or should we go bigger? Right? That That's one of the topics we're going to talk about. Also, if you're not sure where to go find deals, how to be competitive in this environment right now. Guys, I have on with me today, I think one of the leading voices, definitely because he just has a track record to back it up, on how to go off market direct to seller on small to mid-sized multifamily apartments. And in today, now you're gonna get my opinion on what you know what I think about small versus big multifamily, which one you should be doing as well. So this is gonna be a, just a really fun back and forth conversation. Really excited to introduce you guys to Axel Ragnarsson. What's up, my man? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to getting into it. So our community knows, guys, uh, we have actually brought Axel on inside of our community, both at our accelerator level and our mastermind level now. And, and Axel has done some training and, you know, we've gotten access to a lot of the stuff he's done and really teaching our community. I would call it, dude, your secret sauce of purchasing now more than 360 units in the last three years, direct to seller, completely off market, multiple multifamily deals in a pretty competitive market in the Northeast. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, both, um, you know, both a competitive market, kind of the greater Boston area up in the Northeast, and then also down in Central Florida, which is, um, again, that's also a competitive market. It's about as yeah. competitive as it gets down there too. So how do you feel like, how do you feel me calling you, you know, the, the leading expert in <laughs> off market direct to seller multifamily? I mean, who else is talking about this, the level you're talking about it? I'm, I'm not going to stop you. Um, I'll take it for sure. I think there's a lot of folks talking about it on the single family side, but I think there's all kinds of limiting beliefs surrounding it on the multifamily side of the business. And, um, you know, I think we've had a lot of success doing it internally. And I don't know of many, many folks in the multifamily game or in the multifamily sector that are doing this. So, so I'll take it. I won't stop you. I mean, guys, the reason I'm, you can even feel the energy in my voice today is I'm excited about this episode. Like the results, this, like our community is getting, the, the feedback our community is, is giving based on just what Axel has put together, like his system, his approach to finding deals no matter what's happening in the environment. Because here's the thing in today's world, guys, transactions have fell off a cliff. I mean, if you're going through brokers, right, Axel? You, I mean, you mm -hmm. look at the numbers, we're talking about 70%, we're talking about more than half, more than three quarters of on-market transactions have fallen off a cliff year to year, which means if your strategy is primarily based on MLS or broker listings, it's a pretty good chance you're not buying deals right now. Yeah. And we're seeing the same exact thing in our business and um, we're pouring more gas on the direct to seller, you know, fire, so to speak, uh, because we got to, we got to combat that, right? There's the deals aren't coming from the brokers right now. So if we want to stay active, we need to do even more of what we're already doing. And that's what we're thinking about in our business. So we got a lot to cover today, man. So I'm, I'm pumped to get in. Actually, as we always do on the show, man, I just want to pray for us and then we'll jump in. Okay. Sound good. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. God, thank you for Axel. Thank you for just the wisdom that you've given him. Thank you for the perseverance and the endurance that, that you've given him. His health over these last three years to be able to accomplish what he's been able to accomplish, to be able to get to a place today where he's able to teach and help and train others. God, thank you. Thank you for his gifts. Thank you for his business savviness. And I pray that that wisdom would overflow into our audience today. That it would be a blessing, God, that it would create eternal ripple effects as people learn these strategies uh, and be able to take them and apply them and put them into their own businesses and be able to create financial margin and freedom, God, for uh, for themselves, for their families, for those around them. So Lord, I pray that you would use this podcast. That it would be one of those podcasts that people come back and listen to for many years, Lord, that it would continue to be a well that would quench people's thirst for really how to change their financial situation or help them go to the next level, God. So we love you. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's have this debate. All right, let's just go ahead. Officially, officially, the guy who says bigger is better to the guy who says 
small is the only way. I don't know. It's actually not what you say, but for sure, kind of becoming known as a small multifamily guy, smaller multifamily guy. So let me just let me put out my case. You come back. You you put out your case. I'll come back mine. Sure. I always say this, man. The most important number in real estate is the number of units. Why is that? Is because of the multiplication factor, right? We increase rents by twenty five dollars. Heck, we got to you know. I have multiple cases where we're putting laundry into deal, you know, laundry units into deals where we can, you know, that's, that's, we, we rent them at 80 bucks a unit. It cost us 40, that's $40 a unit. We do over that, do that over a hundred units. You know, we're talking about a million dollars in value, man, just from the laundry that we're sticking in this stuff. And so that I would say is my leading case of just when I think about the small things we can do over a period of time in bigger units, the more we can multiply the money. It's not necessarily based on cash flow or tax benefits or any of that. It really is the multiplication effect that happens on our equity over a larger time. The second big reason, man, and this is what I want to get in with you too today, is property management. The scale in terms of property management and the sophistication that happens when you go bigger in large multifamily. And even to define bigger, for at least for me, well, actually, let me not do that yet because I think that's where we might actually find the same page. But when I when I think about going bigger, that that's why I say, man. But fight me on that. Like, am I wrong in that? Tell tell me your thoughts on why you say small and maybe define. Get, let's give a range for what for what you for what you mean. Sure. Yeah. First, we'll define, and then I'll and then I'll share my thoughts as it relates to you know some of the items that you mentioned and how I think about approaching the business from a strategy standpoint. Whether or not you go small, go big, go somewhere in the middle, etc. So, you know, what I define as small is call it five to 30 units, right? Uh, what I would define as kind of mid-sized multifamily, 30 to 80 units. You know, what I would define as large as 80, 90, 100 plus units, right? We're getting up into the triple digits and beyond. And then if you, you know, you're talking three, 400 plus, that's, we're getting very large institutional. And I almost put that in a different category. Sure. So in terms of why I'm pretty passionate about folks buying small multifamily assets or, you know, mid-sized multifamily assets, that five to 80 unit range, I think it really, there's there's nuance in that it depends on someone's individual situation and what they have available to them. I do believe that when you are getting into real estate, you should start small. That is certainly a belief that I have that has served me well. And that I do think other people should really think about in terms of how they're approaching the business when they're starting out. And it's really for a couple of reasons. One, you oftentimes just fundamentally make more money as a new investor getting into this business, doing smaller deals. And I'm happy to jump into the math around that. Two, it is incredibly stressful to get into this in, get into this business, try to find a large asset, try to raise the money, try to put it together, and try and operate it in a way in which you're not going to endanger your investor's capital. You know, that's something that I think has been lost a little bit in the overall discourse around this business. Um, you know, whether it's online, podcasts, what have you, you know, kind of the, the just start off with, with large unit counts. I think that we're forgetting that if we're bringing other investors' money into this, we, we have such a fiduciary responsibility to them that it can somehow or can sometimes put that capital at risk if we're not very confident in what we're doing. Um, you know, the third reason is, uh, you know, I think that there's just, again, there's some nuance, right? If you are an investor who has all kinds of experience doing smaller deals, mid-sized deals, probably would serve you to just try and focus on larger deals. And that's kind of where I'm at now. You know, we do a lot of stuff that's 20 to 80 units. But we've done a couple of larger deals as well. You know, we've done a hundred plus unit deal in Texas. You know, we've done some larger portfolios and aggregate, you know, size up to be a hundred units in size. But, you know, oftentimes when we look at the economics and what we make on those deals, because, you know, maybe we had to bring in a capital partner to help us raise the money and give them a slice of the GP. You know, maybe we had to bring in somebody to help sign in the debt to get us across the finish line. We end up economically making the same amount of money that we would on a deal that was half the size that we just own a little bit more of. So I think it. I think there's nuance around the question, but that's how I think about it. Is depending on the stage of the journey that you're at should dictate what types of properties you're pursuing and what your goals are. And if you're someone newer who's just trying to you know make some passive income, make some actual real dollars, and get into this business, replace your W two, etc. Oftentimes the small deals are the route to doing that. And, you know, stop me whenever you want me to stop me in terms of changing the, the route well, here. Let me but, ask you yeah. this, though, man. I mean, for someone who does have a W-2, who's not doing this full time, who would typically who typically that would be maybe the audience going after the smaller multifamilies, right? The five, to let's call them 30 units. Let's not go mid yet. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Sure. But I guess there's a concern for me of you go too small, then you actually don't have the margin to hire 
third party property management and someone who's working a job, they really can only then go buy one deal because they're, it's going to be a whole nother job managing leasing, bro. I, and that's how I started, right? I started with the duplex route and I was the leasing office. I was the landscaper. So what do you find to be that threshold where you could say you could encourage someone who has a job who wants to create more cash flow to go into real estate, but then not be working 80 hours a week to go do that? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I think I mean, you can you can hire a property manager to manage your small single family or five unit multifamily or your 500 unit complex, right? The, the property managers are available all up and down the spectrum, but they will just be a little bit more expensive as a percentage of the gross revenue, right? Once you hit scale and you get to that 100 plus unit mark, management is a little less expensive because you can afford the on-site staff and the overall dollars that are going out the door to pay the folks managing the asset are a smaller percentage of that top line revenue for sure. But there's still plenty of you know property managers available to manage those small assets too. And you know that was my journey into this, right? I did you know, probably 25, 30 deals that were between three and 10 units in size to get into this business back, uh, you know, six, seven years ago. And after I hit five units, you know, I had a three unit and a duplex. I just hired a management company and they charged me 10%, right? It was 10%. It was market rate management. But for me, my personal philosophy as it relates to the power of real estate investing and, and why it changes people's lives Cash flow is great, right? That's going to help you. You know, that's going to throw some money in your bank account. It's going to allow you to stay in the game. It's going to, you know, you, you, you stack a few properties, few deals, maybe you, you know, replace a good portion of your income. But we both know the real money is made in the equity creation, right? Buying a property, creating value or owning a property over, over time and letting that NOI grow, letting, letting that loan get paid down. And three, four, five years down the line, your equity has grown from, you know, the dollar amount that you started with is some much dollar, you know, some much larger dollar amount. And that's really where the the true, the true wealth is created. That's where the true money is made. And, and oftentimes when you're looking at the smaller deals, yeah, maybe your management costs are a higher percentage of your gross revenue, but you're putting yourself in a position to earn more of that upside to actually create more equity. And because the deals are oftentimes a little bit more simplified, they're smaller, it's easier to find those true discounted deals you're able to actually stack a couple of those together and, and go from that, you know, $100,000 net worth to 500K, a million and beyond versus doing a larger project as you're starting out where you have to bring in a lot of folks to help you with that. And your slice of the pie is so small that it's not necessarily moving the needle for you. Um, and oftentimes those deals can be a little bit more work. And um, so you've not found it to be an issue of, you know, smaller deals. Let me ask you this, man, someone who's going in, you know, they're going to go buy their first 10 unit apartment complex. I mean, I guess one of my concerns, and this is a concern for me, is, you know, I've been telling you like, hey, we're, we're figuring out what level can we go down to and that way we can, you know, find more deals off market is like, we go into a market and we buy a 25 unit deal or 50 unit deal. We only got 50 units, like we're not getting a whole lot of attention from a prop from at least a good property management company. So now we got to go to a smaller, less sophisticated PM company. What do you think about that? Like, how's your experience been? And, and feedback or advice, even for me, is we're like, do we do this? Like, I'm worried about the property management. Like, dude, it's hard to get world class property management to, you know, to actually act right. Imagine, you know, imagine someone who maybe has a college degree managing your property. So, talk to me about that. It's a great point. And I think that's where there's the most, uh, this is where, we could have a really long discussion. I'll try and keep it abbreviated because I think that this is certainly something we face, right? And we brought management in-house up in New Hampshire where we own a few mm. hundred units okay. um, because we had this problem, right? And, and 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 it didn't help that that was a smaller market too, right? I think that it's important to understand the market that you're in. If you're in a big city, a core market, there's probably going to be an, a, you know, a, a few, a handful of property management companies that are well-equipped to handle a 50-unit asset, which in the grand scheme of things is still a sizable piece of real estate, right? That's still a large piece of real estate relative to, you know, what's available in the marketplace for housing. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, there's something interesting about that mid-sized community where you don't necessarily need that on-site staff. Well, it does help to have on-site staff, right? That that does oftentimes make the tenant experience, the resident experience a little bit nicer, right? You walk into the leasing office, you meet the leasing agent, you know, she walks you over to the apartment, he walks you over to the apartment and, and, and there's something, you know, much more efficient about that. Let's say that leasing agent just quits, you know, and now you're scrambling to find a replacement, right? The, the management company has to quickly either move somebody from another community, hire somebody, they call in sick one day and there's no one in the leasing office, you know, maybe there's some complication there. 
there's actually something, at least for me, that's a little bit, um, you know, something nice about not requiring on-site management and having a central hub for a management company that then sends folks over to manage properties or to, you know, to show units, excuse me, or to handle maintenance or what have you. So I will say that you are right. Technically speaking, the quality of management company in terms of like just the, 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 the sheer amount of knowledge in that organization is probably going to be a little bit lower, but I think you overcome it with great operations, you know, great management of that management company. And then just because it's a smaller asset, you've opened up the door to it, acquire it at a better price to go direct to seller, to get more competitive with a broker and I'll compete some of the other smaller buyers that might be trying to go from 10 units up to that 50. They're trying to make that jump. If you're someone who's got multiple 100, 200 unit assets in the market, I'm sure you can outcompete the hell out of the small guys trying to buy those properties, right? And um, and just you know, by virtue of buying a property at, at a below market price, it's a little bit easier to buy a property like that at a below market price. You're then you're creating that equity value, and oftentimes that sometimes can can compensate for the you know the slightly more time intensive nature of the actual property management. So that's my two cents, but that's I think really it's good. very dependent on your market because. The one thing I will agree with you, if you're buying a smaller asset in like a you know small podunk town in the Midwest where there's just a small population and maybe you've got a good, you know, large regional management company that will manage a large asset because it's worth their time, but like there's not a lot of management companies for that small deal. Yeah, you might be in a tricky spot for sure. But I think if you're in a sophisticated market, you can make it work. Uh, or a, a large market, I should and say. I like, I like that nuance of kind of market matters and, and you know, types of, uh, and we're going to talk about market here in a little bit too. Here's a, here's one thing I also want to I want to ask you, man, and and because you just said, I mean, cash flow is nice, and I think a lot of people get into this for cash flow. So I think cash flow is important, um, and but but equity is the real multiplier, right? Let me ask you this: from someone, what can like you're you're at three sixty three hundred sixty units after you close this deal you're working on right now? But what can someone expect? And I would say the the one. Where you would be, if, if I'm making the case against larger syndicated style projects, my first case would be you don't get any cash flow because you don't. If you're really running a syndication model the way it's competitive in the market, you're typically providing most of that cash flow to your investors, right? So it's a fee-based business. Okay. Now, I would make the argument that 60% of BlackRock's income is fees, not cash flow from the real <laughs> estate, but you know, here, here nor there. Um, but But... My question to you, man, is what can someone expect? Let's say they've, they're have they at 100 units, and maybe that's a few buildings. I don't know how, whatever. Got, but their, their primary strategy has been small to mid multifamily stuff. From a cash flow standpoint, what do you think they're doing? And, and then from an equity standpoint, what do you like? What do you think their equity is going to be in that deal, you know, three, four, five years from now? Just like, and in, in, in full transparency, this is kind of the question I'm asking, like, is this really worth doing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is the juice worth the squeeze here to go down and go smaller? Give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, no. And I'm glad you asked this because I was going to ask you if I could get into like a, a simple math example that kind of illustrates this, at least for me. Brass tax, um, baby. That's let's get what brass tax. Want. You so, know, I got to tell you this funny story offline about, I, yeah. used, I tried to use that term the other day and I totally, can I just tell everyone, I just got to tell my audience go for it. hilarious story, dude. <laughs> this is probably like not PG. If kids are listening, like pause. Um, I'm in like this legit negotiation. Okay. We're negotiating this, these terms on this deal. Very, very tense kind of moment of the conversation. I'm like, listen, just give it to me brass balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I realized What's exactly that? what I said and everybody kind of went quiet. And then do we all just started busting out laughing, like in the middle of this like tense negotiation. And so it's become this oh, funny man. thing like brass balls, you know, when we're trying to get really serious about something. So give it to me, man. Like, give, give me the break. Sure. I'll give it, I'll give you the breakdown. And I'm going to talk about how I built my business because it relates to this, right? When I, as I was growing my business, right, this is first three few years in the business. I had a very clear vision. It was, I'm going to do these small deals along the way to build the business's cash flow base and to build the business's equity, build my balance sheet. And also to just, you know, stay in the game because because you can do a higher volume of these smaller deals and you're just more in the market when you're doing more deals. And along the way, we'll syndicate some larger deals, right? For me at the time, I was defining large as like 50 units, right? This was a few years back. Now we define that as midsize, as we mentioned. But to me at the time, I was like, you know, these the deals that are larger than what I can take down on my own, I'll syndicate and I'll blend the two strategies together. And what I found was, I remember I like at one point, 
I actually looked at the economics between doing a five unit deal in, in my market and a 50 unit deal. And I'm going to, and I remember I had this, I sat down and I was doing this math on a, on a piece of paper and I was like, geez, man, I don't make as much on, like I make money on this 50 unit deal, but like, it's not as much as I'd like in the, and here's the math, right? So at the time properties were trading for around a hundred thousand dollars a unit in the market I was buying. And this is a couple of years back. And I was, you know, I had bought a five unit property for $500,000 and I'm, I'm making the numbers so a little bit more round here so that it's an easy example for everybody. But, um, you know, $100,000 uh, uh, a unit um, was the market pricing up there. So a five unit property, you know, bought it for 500, 100,000 a unit and, uh, you know, put about a hundred down at the time I was putting 20% down, right. I was getting, you know, some leverage and, um, you know, I was looking at, it, I was like, all right, if in three years, this is worth 600 K, you know, if, cool. I, you know, I, I've made a hundred grand. Right. And I'm just hypothetically putting these numbers on paper for simplicity's sake, let's forget the closing costs. Let's forget renovations. So, you know, we're paying 500, it's worth 600 in a few years, make a hundred. Right now I'm thinking, all right, let's think about if I'm going out there and buying a 50 unit deal. Um, you know, again, for example, say hundred thousand dollars a unit, same market, we're spending $5 million on that property. Um, but I want to go raise all the money for it. Right. Maybe I got to put in my little co-invest, you know, so I got to, I got to, let's, let's say we're raising a million and a half or something along those lines. Uh, I got to bring in 150 K or something like that. So I still got to bring money to the table. You know, maybe I bring a little bit less. I bring a hundred, but I'm, it's not like I'm not bringing any money. I'm still bringing some money because I got to co-invest. And at the time, in order for me to do that deal, um, I needed to bring in a partner to help me raise the money. Cause I didn't have those capital connections yet. I could go find the deals like nobody else, but uh, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in a position to, to, to take them to closing just from a debt standpoint, from a money areas and the money standpoint, et cetera. So I remember the first 50 unit deal I did was, you know, kind of similar economics to this, but the, the high, you know, the hypothetical situation stands where I had to bring in a, you know, co GP to do the deal with, to help me raise the money, to help me sign on the loan and also to help me operate it because they were local to that market and had a big portfolio. So I gave up half the GP and I, you know, to my partner and I had the other half and, um, and I realized like, wow, you know, after we pay the pref, there's, you know, there's really no money that's getting distributed to us, right? We were doing the standard, you know, uh, 8% pref, 70, 30 split, wasn't making any money. And then when you look at what you actually make when you exit the deal, which is really where people who syndicate deals make money outside of the fees, right? Outside of the fees along the way. This is the example I like to use. We sell this property for $6 million in three years, right? Same percentage appreciation over the years as the five unit deal. We make a million dollars instead of a hundred grand, but out of that million dollar profit, right? We pay our investors back. We send their capital accounts to zero. We got a million dollars left to distribute and 700 is going to the investors because they get that 70% of the upside. 30% is going over to the GPs, me and a business partner, because that's what I had to do to get that deal done. We're both left with 150 grand. And it's like, cool, like, that's great. I, you know, I'm glad that I made some money here, but um, I could have just made basically the same amount of money on a five unit deal. And I can find that, I can find a discounted five unit deal with my eyes closed. And I could have bought that 500 unit deal or that, excuse me, that five unit deal for 400 K if I just, you know, apply a little bit of effort into direct seller marketing and, you know, just maintain some diligence there. And that's got a more material effect on my net worth. And along the way with that five unit deal, let's say I'm just making, you know, 150 bucks a month in free cash flow after I pay expenses, debt service, et cetera. You know, all right, cool. Now I'm making, you know, call it whatever that is, 700 bucks a month, 750 a month in cash flow over the course of a year. That's, you know, 10 grand or whatever that is for round numbers. That's starting to make a meaningful dent from a passive income standpoint in my life where on the 50 unit deal, I'm not making any passive income. You know, maybe we got, you throw an asset management fee in there, but like, it's not going to be, it's probably not going to be 10 grand, right? If you got a one, 2% asset management fee on a deal of that size. So when you think about the math through that lens, it's like, sure, you are making more money on the 50 unit deal. And if you do the whole thing, if you're the only GP, if you find it, you raise all the money, you operate it. Yeah. There's a more compelling argument, right? You make 300 K, you make some fees, maybe all in over the course of that deal, you make four or 500 G's. Yeah. That's obviously a lot more than a hundred. Right. But, um, I think the challenge with new folks is they're forced to bring in multiple co-GPs, multiple partners to help them get a deal like that done. And oftentimes when you really break down the economics, there's not that much left when the deal is all said and done. You're giving a lot of it to your LPs if you're using those kind of you know standard syndication, that standard syndication structure. Um, and that, I think that's a deal that people would be happy with. That's a deal that LPs would be happy with, right? If they did a you know 1.7X on their money in three years, 
that's kind of what is normal in the syndication world where you look to two X in five years or so you're, you're basically in that realm. So that's, that's a normal deal for LPs, normal deal for GPs. So for me, I was like, I could just make more money in these small ones. Right. Yeah, And not only that, you know, to, to, to your point is you're also holding to the expectations of the investors you brought in, right. At a big level, like you, um, you have to hit a certain metric, right. Or you're trying, you're, maybe you're forced to sell at five years because that's what, you know, investors are looking for. And so, um, totally with you there. I, I, I do think it's worth people to really consider what, you know, am I looking to do this full time as a business and with a plan to really grow and, and, and get into bigger deals quickly? Because if not, I'm with you, man, I, I do tell people that's why I brought you into our community to teach people how to do small, mid sized multifamily, because I think for most people, for most people, like most hope people hear me on this. Mm hmm. I don't actually think syndication is the right move. Like I mm -hmm. think focusing, targeting on small, mid-sized multifamily, I always say, and just so we're on, just so everybody hears me, I know I'm I'm quoted a lot for saying going bigger. I do believe you should go bigger, but bigger than what you've probably thought you could do, which most of you would probably settle for a duplex or a quadplex. My threshold I teach is I think I think 30 units. $30,000 of NOI years, you know, that's kind of the threshold. Like you want something that's going to pay 30 grand. Um, 30 units is typically where I think is a good threshold. Like that's a good size asset and you don't need to go syndicate that. You could probably find a few investors at JV to go do that deal with, even if you don't have the money. And so I, I really think it's worth considering for folks is if you're not going to go really do this as a business, full-time yeah, business. I'm interrupting you, my bad. But I think um, I think it's important to note you can do both as well. Like I'm doing both right now. I, I personally take down a lot of eight unit deals, 16 unit deals, 22 unit deals. You know, the last time we chatted, I think was probably a few weeks back. Um, you know, we put a 23 in a deal under contract and that's like, you know, it was direct to seller, like killer deal. We're going to pay 2.2. It's worth three. Like I, I could go wholesale it and make, you know, a couple hundred, few hundred K without even doing the deal. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of work to make that amount of money on a big deal, but I'm still trying to do those big deals because my goal is to, you know, personally, Axel Ragnarsson buy these small deals and have a portfolio of a couple hundred deals that I have moderate leverage on that is just paying my bills, right. Yeah. And supporting the business, but also to provide a platform in which I can raise capital and do larger deals. And I think you can have your cake and eat it too. You can do both. And one often leads to the other. One often gives you the opportunities, you know, pursuing smaller deals, direct to seller, speaking with brokers or what have you and doing that stuff. Every once in a while, you stumble into that 50, 60 unit portfolio by that landlord that's looking to retire. And okay, now you got something. You got a $6 million deal. You go raise two and a half, three million bucks to take it down. That's now you're, now you're getting to some size. And over time, if you can take a larger percentage of that general partnership, you can raise the money and you can operate it and you can sign the debt. That's where the economics become really attractive. But doing quote unquote larger deals, however, that's defined to you personally as an investor, and then just giving up, like you bring in a co GP for the money, you bring in a co GP for the capital, you bring in a, or for the, uh, to, to sign the loan, you bring in a co GP to help you operate it. Next thing you know, you got 20, 30% of a general partnership. When you actually sit down and do that math, you're like, geez, I'm actually, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking home that much. Right. So yeah. I think it's important to understand what's going on behind the scenes and to not just do the bigger ones blindly because, you think that you're going to make more money. Cause I, I, I don't think a lot of people stop to do the math. Long story short is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think it's really good, man. It's a good point. It's good to be intentional with that. Um, do you, are you recourse, non-recourse loans typically? I usually buy our value add stuff with recourse and then refinance into non-recourse. So my goal is to get into non-recourse as fast as I can. Um, and I, so my big asterisk is, and, and you and I have talked about this. I do think that you should really try to set a line from a deal size standpoint with like million dollar loan balances so that you can get into that non-recourse world with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or even some local banks and credit unions. I mean, you know, I still do the smaller ones, but I'll do the smaller ones and then I'll quickly package up a few small deals and a portfolio loan. Um, so we get to that million yeah, dollar loan that's balance. That's advice there. guys. And that's, that's, yeah. that's, if you haven't been in this, you just kind of crack, you don't know that, that, you know, you want to know what I, the most important piece of this game guys, the most important piece of this game, hear me on this is financing. There's nothing yeah. more important to know and understand and understand the, 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 the end game, 70 to 90% of the deal. 
And I'll tell you how, you know how, why this is the most important thing in real estate. And I've learned this clearly all, we're all learning this in a new way right now. Go back to 08, 09. And, and in th three years, we're going to say, go back to 23 and 24. Okay. All those deals got traded, right? All those deals either were forced to sell, people lost money, et cetera. What happened to the real estate? Nothing happened to the real estate. The real estate is still there. This is that people's equity vanished because of financing. And so that is such a key, a key part. So I love that million dollar loan balance. All right, Axel, listen, I know we're not gonna have enough time, but we got 20 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. We got 20 minutes. And I, I want this segment of the show to be something that people come back to over and over and over and over and over again of like the guide. And I know we got 20 minutes, but hey, you know- you, I'll you, do it, I'll, I'll talk you fast. You know we got a lot more for them. So I can here, be concise. Yeah. Here's where yeah. I want you to start though, okay? I want you to get out of your market and I want you to put yourself in the shoes of me or someone, someone listening. And they're going to say, I, I'm, it's a blank canvas in terms of the market that I should pick. And then I go into that market and now I have to go find deals, direct to seller off market. Start with me, identify how we would identify a key market for this particular strategy. And then how we begin to build out a system and a process for contacting owners and buying these deals off market. Uh, you're on the clock. All right. So Ellis is in beautiful San Diego. Let's say he wants to go, you know, somewhere else and buy some deals. First things first, define who you want to compete with. Who are you able to compete with? What I define as what I'm able to compete with are folks that are operating in secondary and tertiary markets. I want to be the big fish in a small pond because that's where my dollars stretch from a marketing standpoint. That's where my time stretches from a prospecting standpoint. So I don't want to compete with people in core Boston. So I go an hour north up into New Hampshire and I crush the market up there, right? Same thing in central Florida. I don't want to compete with folks in Tampa. I go 30, 40 minutes inland to Lakeland, Florida. 125,000 people, I crushed that market. So is there a demographic that you've like a population size that you found are good? 100K is, I don't want to go smaller than 100K unless it's a small market that serves a nearby market that is bigger. But I think 100K is like a fair kind of benchmark to make because that's where you have the abundance of the management companies of the service providers and Got all it. the folks that can help you run a deal. Got it. So first things first, define where you're going to buy, you know, Make sure it checks all the other good market boxes, the, the growth stuff, right? Make sure you're comfortable with all of that. And then, but you need to make sure you can compete there. So pick a market that you feel you can compete in. After you do that, define your physical criteria. Real quick, can I ask you one more question back to market? Yep. Do you, before you go into a market like a Lakeland or uh, wherever you're at, you live, do you look at transaction volume? Like before you go in, I made the mistake of picking a market like Tucson where there was not, it's a great market, but not a lot of transactions happening there. Is that something that you would look at? I like minimal transaction volume because it means the market is more opaque. There's, it's less efficient. There's more opportunity for mispricing, misinformation. And there's a wider disparity between the people that are in the know and the people that are just playing at this. The more transactions there are on a market, the more efficient it is, the more every seller is aware what their property is worth. Less oh, data points- really interesting. Less that's data really points is better actually. because- if something hasn't sold in the last six months, people are going off feel. And if you are really good at what you do, you're a really good operator, you really know how to value this stuff, that's where you can find that's the margin really and the edge. Okay, let me. I know you're, I, I'm slowing you down here, but these are good questions. <laughs> so then do you look at how many deals there are to actually purchase in that market? My point is I don't want to pick a market that just looks good, but two years later, I've only purchased two deals. Yes, no, and, that, and that's, so that's the good, that's the question, right? So you should be, you know, you need to get some kind of a data source, right? You need list source, Reonomy. Those are the two that we use. Reonomy's co-stars, baby brother, as I like to call it. It's really good. You know, drop the money if you're going to do this at scale. It's 400 bucks a month. Yeah, that's expensive, but it's really, really good for what you need it for. Pull a list in your target market in the property sizing that you want to prospect to. We do 10 to 100 doors. We have a wide range. I do the small stuff. I syndicate the bigger stuff within that. And you want to look at how many physical properties there are in that market. There should be at least five, six, 700 to play with here. You, you need, you need to have a base of, of, of actual, you know, recipients for your mail and your cold calls, because there's a lot of markets. Like there's a couple of weird little markets in South Carolina that I've looked at where the majority of the housing stock is like two to 10 unit properties. And then like a hundred plus unit properties. And there's not that much in the middle. Like there are some weird cities like that. Right. 500 um, within your criteria of that. Yes. Let's just identify today, 30 to 80, let's call it right. Of that, of that criteria. 
Yep, exactly. So you want to make sure that you have enough to play with there to your point, right? You, you don't want to just do this and just... And you think 500 is a big enough threshold? For me, for me, it is, right? Because we go really, really deep with the people we reach out to. I like to say like every single person that owns a property in that market is going to hear from me and they're going to hear from me regularly. So even if we capture a small percentage of that available group, it's profitable for us to do this. And then we do this in multiple markets, right? So we might only be at 500 to 700 in terms of our list size in a given, in a given area, but we're doing this across multiple different markets. So in right, aggregate, cool. let me leave going- you alone. Cause then I, we're down to 13 minutes and you got a lot, you, you got to help people find their, find a deal from listening to this podcast show. So go ahead. Yep. Gotcha. So buyer list, right? Go to Rihanna, go to list source to find your market, your criteria, buyer list, quick little filters for it. You want to filter out anything that's sold in the last three years. If you want your money to go a little bit further and you want to increase the odds that you're going to reach this, reach someone who has some equity in, and is able to sell at a discount after you do that. You're going to have to define how you're going to reach these people. We do three things. We send direct mail, we cold call, and we cold email. And then after we contact somebody and have some level of a conversation, we're comfortable texting them as well, but we don't lead with text because we feel that's intrusive. So the, the basic process here, build out a direct mail piece, you know, quick plug for the course, right? That, that I put together. We have all of our direct mail content in there, which, you know, LSU might mention at the end of this. Send a mail piece on the first of the month. You want to start calling through your list from the seventh to kind of the 14th, you want to spend a week calling through your list. Maybe it takes you a little bit longer, a little bit less, depending on how big your list is. You want to call this list and you want to, you know, reference the mail piece that you sent them either live on the phone or in a voicemail that you leave. And then throughout the end of the month, call it the 14th to the you know 20th. Basically, you want to wrap up the month with emailing that list as well. And your email copy is going to be very similar to your direct mail copy. And this is all just a version of the messaging of, Hey, you want to reach out, want to build a relationship, saw you on this property, would love to make an offer on it. If not, no problem. Want to get to know another investor in the marketplace. You know, here's my info, right? And that's what you want to do to your whole list. Most investors, you know, that go direct to seller are doing one of these things. Some are doing two, hardly anyone does all three. So if you want to really stand out, you do all three. And I do this, you know, every other month from a mail standpoint, we mail every other month, we mail six times a year, because that's what we feel is reasonable. Now, if you want to supercharge this, put everybody in the market on an, on an email list, on an email distribution list that you have spoken with. You don't want to cold email people through MailChimp. It's going to burn your deliverability. You don't want to do that. But everyone that you've had a conversation with in the marketplace, sellers, brokers, uh, you know, mortgage brokers, lenders, title companies, GCs, manager, everyone that is hyper-local to this market, you throw in a list, you send them, send them a newsletter every month. Take you know an hour each month to put together a newsletter with some value add facts about the market. End it with a call to action talking about how you want to buy deals and you send that monthly. If you do all of this, you are becoming omnipresent in your market with everybody that's active in this marketplace. So that's what you do from in terms of building the top of the funnel. People are going to call you. You're going to speak with people. And now what do you do, right? Get them in a CRM. You want to get them in some kind of CRM that you can stay you know consistent with. We use a CRM called ReSimply, which is, in my opinion, the best real estate specific direct to seller CRM out there. And um, it's not expensive, a couple hundred a month. Maybe it's even less than that. I can't remember. But uh, but that's what we use. And now you're, you know, now you're working these people down the middle of the funnel and you're starting to get into sales, you know, uh, 101. Sales, traditional sales stat takes seven times uh, or seven touches to convert a prospect from a prospect into a customer. That's when you're trying to sell somebody something. In this case, you're trying to buy something, but the theory still stands. You got to, you got to hit these people seven times. So commit to consistent follow-up, take great notes, set follow-up reminders, have the budget in you, you know, have, make sure you have the budget to send, uh, you know, five plus rounds of mail. You want to do this for a year, make sure you have the, the mental fortitude. If you're calling to do that consistently for a couple of months, you know, if you're not cold calling and you want to just do cold email or you want to do something else, make sure you have the time set aside to stay consistent with that over that period of time. And then deals will start to churn out. But most of the deals that we do, and I wish I had slightly better data on this, but this is just me talking from feel most of the deals we do, we have been speaking with a seller for six to nine months. Like that is, that's kind of your ticket to entry until you have done that. You have not earned the right to buy anything. So if you think that you should have bought something, your expectations are completely misaligned in the multifamily game. That's the sales cycle here. We're not flipping houses where people are, you know, they're, they're going through foreclosure and they pick up the phone and they sell you the property, typically buying stuff from multifamily folks that aren't 
dealing with the same levels of financial distress as some single family folks are. So we need to commit to that process along the way. And then from there, you know, it's just rapport building, all the sales one-on-one stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll stop there because I was talking fast, but I want to make sure you have a chance to, to dive filter into out that. sales that have happened within the last three years. So you want deals that have been purchased long, more than three years ago. Define your outreach. So direct your, and then by the way, if you're asked, well, how do I get these, these guys, you're going to go to a source like Reonomy. This is a data source. It's already put the data together. You're going to filter out that data source by deals that have been less, you know, sold within longer than three years within your criteria, that 30 to 80 units. Do you care about vintage? Do you care about anything else in that filter list? We personally don't, but if you do throw that in there as well, you know, filter down into what you want to buy. I'll add one more tip and then I'll shut up. But if you want to get really tactical with this, you, you get a couple of data lists. You get your master one that doesn't have a lot of filters. It's in your market, in that range, no more than, you know, uh, last sale three plus years ago. But then you pull another list that maybe is like the exact vintage you want to buy. It's like, you know, 80s to early 2000s built in that zip code that you really want to buy in, that you really feel like you can get competitive from an offer standpoint in, um, or, you know, there's some other factor that you want to filter it. Then you lay those two lists on top of each other. You see which properties are on both lists. And those are the folks that you get, that you do the stuff that's not scalable, where you send a one-to-one video that you record via Loom, you know, 60 seconds. Hey, my name's John. I want to get face-to-face with you. Like I'm, I'm doing something that's taking time out of my day to get in front of you. And I really want to talk to you about your property. Or you send them a certified piece of mail for seven to 10 bucks that like literally says priority mail on it. That mail gets opened. If it's hitting the right person, they're going to open that mail. And you do stuff that isn't necessarily easy and isn't necessarily scalable. And that's where you start to see that's those are the deals that people put up on Instagram where it's like, we, we bought this $4 million asset for 3 million bucks. Like that's where you start to get the crazy deals, right? Right. So all of the other stuff helps you build the top of the funnel. That stuff really helps you nail down those killer deals. So you were on the topic of data. So I wanted to quickly throw that that's in there. That's great, man. I, I love I didn't that. want to let Dude, it go without mentioning that. That's really killer. That's a really good tip. Direct mail every other month, phone calling every we typically call after we send our mail. Um, but again, if got you got it. like, we got a big list. So oftentimes we're calling throughout the month and then we're emailing, you know, end of the month into the early, the next month. Cause we're just working through a big list now. And, but, and uh, are you yeah. going virtual VAs, Filipino VAs calling, or is this someone on your team calling? So we did that. Um, and we quickly realized that it was burning our brand reputation to have somebody that wasn't really like really familiar with this business calling folks. So I have a, I mean, I've really invested in this in our business, as you can tell, right? I have a W2 salaried, like he's in Boston with me. He's, a, he's an acquisitions manager and he's the one that calls and he's from, he's a former multifamily broker earning a salary plus commission on what he finds. Plus he's getting some equity. And it's just a much, much better way to do this because when somebody picks up the phone and they hear someone that just, they, they can, these owners can tell immediately, like this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And like, the, if you're a multifamily owner, you're always screening for credibility. Like you don't want to spend time speaking with someone who you don't think could even close, even if you came to the right price. So we got, we moved away from that because we quickly realized that that was not doing our brand, uh, you know, any service. And I brought somebody in who was local to the U S who had multifamily experience. And before that I was doing this, like this was personally something I was doing, but you can bring in a VA very easily to help with the direct emails. Like we have a VA that sends the emails we have a VA that works on the data side. We have a VA that helps with our high-level underwriting, you know, all of that stuff. Amazing. Do I love what you said, man. And you should take you should take this clip and put it as a reel. You take seven touches, which means it's gonna take about six to nine months to really get trust. If you haven't done that work, you do not deserve to do a deal yet. That's massive, man. And I talk about yeah. this like. Guys, at this level, when you're buying 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 unit apartment buildings, the 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 equity that that can create over the next 10 years can change your family's future completely, right? It can well, change a generation. One deal is crazy in what it can do. And, and this is where I started to get passionate about it. It's because it's like, I've seen this. Like we just did, we're buying 65 units right now. We're under contract to buy 65 units that we're buying at like 15 to 20%, depending on who appraises it, below current market value. It's a six and a half million dollar deal. That's a direct seller deal. That's insane. Like, that's crazy. Like, and it, you know, for me, I get a little peeved when people are like, oh, this stuff doesn't work in multifamily. It's like, it just does. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I think it's just a patience thing or, you know, you're just not, you're just not doing it right. But it's like, 
Last year, we did 10 deals that were between 30 and 80 units in size. Wow. The equity that as a result that results from that is insane. My yeah. acquisitions guy just yesterday, he, he cold emailed a guy who he thought owned 85 units in Tampa, Florida. Turns out that the guy actually tore it down a couple of years back and built a 444 unit class, a luxury community. He's, he's out of Sweden. Like he's, he's a, he's an international developer and he's in and, and my acquisitions guy are going back and forth. It's a $160 million deal. He's taking it out to, to market. And he's like, I'll send you all the financials. Just sign the NDA. Like you, if you guys want to try and, you know, take a crack at it, like we'll do a little bit of diligence on your group, but like, we'll let you do this before we actually sign a listing agreement. It's a $160 million deal. That's insane. How are we going to get it? Probably not. That's a bit of, we're playing a bit out of our shoes there. And, you know, he probably wants market, but like, he's willing to give us that time. This is a guy who's worth $500 million. So, yeah. You know, it's just, you just have to do it. Like, I don't think people realize what's on, what's at stake here until you do it. Long story. Well, that's my point though, man, is like, what would you rather do if, and I always say this, man, if, if I, if I could give you $2,400 today, which is, let's say a du the annual cash flow from one duplex, or if I could guarantee you in three years, you could make $3 million from a deal, but from now until three years, you couldn't earn $1, which one would you take? Rowdy's most people would take would say, hey, I'd take the three million in three years. However, we don't live like that, right? We don't put in, we, we go after the shiny object syndrome. We we give up after a few months of hard work. But the rowdy is, man, this is the this is the blueprint for creating millions, right? Through through multifamily, through through really commercial real estate investing. And so guys, um, I hope you enjoyed this show. I want to shout out Axel, aligned real estate partners. His Instagram, I think, is really, really helpful. Uh, it, it, your Instagram handle is, is what, um, Axel? It's at Multifamily Wealth. At Multifamily Wealth. If you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, he has a, a, a podcast, Multifamily Wealth. Is yeah, well. Multifamily Multi Wealth Podcast, yeah. The Multifamily Wealth Podcast. And guys, let me just sh say this. Me and Axel have partnered together because, as you can tell, this guy knows his stuff. And if you want to actually go deep on this, you want – real coaches you want to get axel's brain and you want the kingdom rei team to walk you through on a weekly basis how to go and purchase your next large deal guys we have a program for you go to kingdomrei.com we now have the we we have a program that will get you started no matter what your starting point is uh as well as a mastermind where we'll actually go and do deals with you okay so if you want to learn about any of this breaking into this commercial real estate market partnering on deals together, really making a significant impact in this real estate space, but more importantly for the kingdom, because imagine the wealth we can create, the income we can generate from this business and what we can go do together. That's the vision of what we're building at Kingdom REI. Go to kingdomrei.com. The step would be to fill out an application and jump on a call with our team, okay? Probably myself or maybe someone else on my team. And let's just see if this is a good fit. Let's see if you have the time, the margin, right? Uh, the as Axel just put the perseverance <laughs> to really yeah. go do this, and if you do, man, we love to we love to partner with you. Go kingmarii.com, uh, go check that out, and and uh, really excited to be partnering with you, Axel, on this man. And we're gonna help a lot of people, so I'm I'm really pumped about this. And this episode, dude, is powerful. It's gonna help a lot of people. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on, and um, obviously grateful for our partnership too. And Glad to hear that everybody that's in the community that's running through the program too is seeing some value and actually getting out there and speaking with sellers and you know making offers and doing all that fun stuff. Yeah, it's happening, man. Good stuff's happening. So hey, I appreciate you, man. Seriously, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit stop recording and jump off this podcast. Everybody else, go to kingdomrei.com. Max, we'll talk soon, brother. Thank you.